Hello and good evening. I'm Fana Sheh and you're watching Awani Tonight. Kedah Menteri Besar Datuk Seri Muhammad Sanusi Manor pleads not guilty to two charges of sedition in Selayang Sessions Court. Both charges were under Section 41A of the Sedition Act over a political speech on July 11th. For the first charge, Sanusi was accused of insulting the Selangor Royal Institution during his speech. He was reported to have belittled the appointment of Selangor Menteri Besar Amiruddin Shari. Sanusi was also charged under the same Sedition Act for questioning Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim's statement on the royal decree and the formation of the unity government. A bail was set for 5,000 ringgit for each charge and Sanusi was placed under a gag order to refrain from speaking about the case. Both cases are fixed for mention on October 4th. The use of the Sedition Act against the Kedah Menteri Besar was unavoidable as it concerned the rulers, says Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. Noting that the Selangor Royal Council had lodged a police report, he says he will entrust the decision-making process to the courts. Saya dari segi dari segi dasar ni kita elak dari penggunaan uh, akta sultan tapi yang ni boleh menyentuh kedudukan raja-raja um, soal kritik Perdana Menteri saya tak pernah gunakan itu sebagai satu alasan tapi ini soal uh, ke kedudukan dan martabat raja-raja yang harus kita pelihara dan sanjung dan elak daripada menjadi suatu uh, wacana perbahasan politik yang tidak sihat. A by-election for the Kuala Terengganu parliamentary seat will be held concurrently with the six state polls on August 12th. The Election Commission says nominations and early voting for the by-election will also be held on July 29th and August 8th, respectively. The Kuala Terengganu seat fell vacant after the Terengganu Election Court cancelled the victory of Datu Ahmad Amzad Hashim from PAS on June 27th. Ahmad Amzad had won the seat with the majority of 40,907 votes in the 15th general election. This followed sufficient evidence that corruption had taken place with the aim of influencing voters. In response to the court decision, PAS had said it would not appeal and was prepared to face the by-election. In other news, 55 lots of lands in Sabah and Sarawak, which were handed over to the federal government but remained undeveloped, will be returned to both territories. Deputy Prime Minister Dato Sri Farila Yusof says the governments of Sabah and Sarawak will reimburse Putrajaya with the amount that was paid when it acquired the land. But what we have agreed in, in terms of policy, anything... Uh, any land that is being acquired by the federal government, but it is not developed within five years, so that will entitle the state to claim back from the federal government. Uh, and of course, uh, from there on, they will negotiate. And then federal government will have to justify. If they still need the land, they will ask for extension and they will uh, justify why they need that particular land. Otherwise, it has to be uh, returned back to the state. Fadila was speaking after chairing a meeting of the Technical Committee on the Malaysia Agreement 1963 or MA63. He also announced that a special grant of 300 million ringgit will soon be disbursed to the governments of Sabah and Sarawak under Article 112D of the Federal Constitution. Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim has ordered Kuala Lumpur City Hall, DBKL, to gazette the 2040 Kuala Lumpur Structural Plan or KLSP 2040 draft before the end of this year. He urges DBKL to focus on maintaining forest reserves and open spaces to achieve the goal of making KL a green, healthy and lively city. Anwar also agreed on the need for more affordable housing in the city centre, to accommodate the growing demand of residents. In a statement, Anwar said he was satisfied with DBKL's engagement sessions held on the draft plan. The engagement session, which had been extended from May 18th to May 26th, has seen DBKL receiving 639 views from 425 participants. The Prime Minister previously called for a delay to the gazettement of the KLSP 2040 draft, saying that it needed to be reviewed by lawmakers and experts in the field. The KLSB 2040 is aimed at guiding the city's development over the next 20 years. Chinese automobile manufacturer Geely will invest 10 billion US dollars to turn Tanjung Malim in Perak into Southeast Asia's largest auto city. 
Prime Minister Dato Sri Anubrahim says this was conveyed in a letter to him by the company last night. Ini kali pertama saya nak sebut ni, Geely. Itu Amerika. Geely ini yang buat dengan proton. Dia tulis saya 10 halaman muka surat panjang. Bagi tahu dia nak teruskan nak jadikan Tanjung Malim sebagai kota otomobil kereta yang terbesar di Nantau ini. Dan dia akan mula dengan 10 bilion dolar mana 40 bilion ringgit. Anwar said the investment would provide thousands of job opportunities for young Malaysians. He noted that Malaysia had recorded commendable economic performance with a 5.6% growth in the first quarter of 2023, which compared favourably against China, Singapore and Indonesia. Anwar added that the country had attracted 71 billion ringgit worth of approved investments in the first three months of the year. We will go for a quick break. Stay tuned for more. Long direction? Mesti ada sebab jadi macam tu. Apa yang aku kena buat untuk pulihkan akit? Cinta Wrong Direction. Stream on demand bila-bila masa di mana sahaja dengan Astro Baharu. Welcome back. Southeast Asian nations must boldly express their concerns directly to China if they believe their interests are being threatened. Anya Manuel, Executive Director of the Aspen Strategy Group, emphasizes the importance of open dialogue and urges these countries not to rely solely on the United States to address their grievances. I think this is a really important moment for Malaysia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, all of the Southeast Asian countries because you have market economies, you have well-educated young people. I see this from the CEOs and U.S. companies that I work with. People want to do business with all of you and that's a positive thing. And I think there is a way through this complicated situation where the world will not be forced to take sides between China and the United States. So one thing that Malaysia, Vietnam and others could do is uh, when they see China encroaching in ways that they don't like, speak up and be honest. You know, don't just rely on the United States to make the difficult arguments and say this is U.S. versus China. It's really, um, we would hold out an open hand to China and no one wants conflict with China. Um, if China does the same in return. So I think what we're seeing is that China is frightening us and that's why you're seeing a reaction. Anya also highlights the significance of Southeast Asian countries pushing back against any major powers, including the US government if they witness any missteps. She emphasizes the importance of constructive feedback in maintaining peace and believes that it is possible to navigate this complex situation without the world being forced to choose sides between China and the US. And I think it's very important, and this is where your region plays a critical role, and that is it is in everyone's interest, everyone's, for the U.S. and China not to have a hot conflict, and frankly, not even to have a cold war, right? And so the more that your countries and your governments can say to the Chinese when they're overreaching, hey, you're overreaching, we all don't like this, it's not just you versus the U.S., that would be helpful, and also you can push back on the U.S. government if you see things that the U.S. is maybe making mistakes. I think our government would be very open to that. Anya made these remarks during a briefing with journalists from the Foreign Press Center International Reporting Tour in San Francisco. Addressing global warming requires a new kind of cooperation between China and the United States, says U.S. climate envoy John Kerry. He is on a three-day visit to China in hopes of reviving a climate cooperation between the two nations, which has been mired in disputes over issues of trade, technology and the self-governed island of Taiwan. President Biden is really hopeful that we can advance the climate agenda. And China and the United States 
of the two most powerful economies in the world. We also happen to be the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And so the imperative of our two countries coming together and working and showing the rest of the world how we can cooperate and begin to address this with the urgency it requires is incredible. Kerr's visit to China came as the Northern Hemisphere endured record-setting summer heat waves. Addressing Premier Li Chiang, the former Secretary of State warned that the situation could get worse, as China's northwestern Xinjiang region had recorded an all-time high temperature of 52.2 degrees Celsius on Sunday. Climate talks between the two biggest greenhouse gas emitters came to a halt last year after Nancy Pelosi, then Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, enraged Beijing by visiting self-ruled Taiwan, which China considers to be a part of its territory. Kerry is the third top U.S. official to visit Beijing in the past month, after Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Meanwhile, the U.S. and South Korea have launched talks to coordinate allied responses in the event of a nuclear war with North Korea. President Yoon suk yeol says the first meeting of the Nuclear Consultative Group, NCG, is an important starting point to build a strong deterrence against the North. The establishment of NCG was first announced during the bilateral summit between Yoon and U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington in April. Pyongyang, which test-fired an intercontinental ballistic missile last week, condemned the NCG for openly discussing the use of nukes. The nation, along with China, have criticized the group's formation as further raising tensions within the Korean Peninsula. Australia's state of Victoria will not host the 2026 Commonwealth Games due to projected cost overruns. Victoria State Premier Daniel Andrews says the game, planned to be held in four regional hubs, would have cost $7 billion from a budgeted $2.6 billion Australian dollars. Uh, but we've looked at Melbourne, we've looked at less sports, we've looked at less hubs, we've looked at every conceivable option. All of them are far in excess of the $2.6 billion that's been budgeted, so all of them represent more cost than there is benefit. And on that basis, none of those options stack up and we're not going to be hosting the Games in 2026. Andrew said Victoria has informed the Commonwealth Games Federation the cost of breaking the 2026 contract has yet to be decided. No other countries outside Australia had bid for the 2026 Games. That wraps up our Wani tonight. I'm Fahana Thank you for watching.